Hi, I'm Dana Goodyear, a staff writer at The New Yorker, and I'm here with Sean Rad, who is the 30-year-old founder and CEO of Tinder, which is a location-based and photo-based dating app, headquartered in West Hollywood, California, and incubated as part of Barry Diller's IAC project, right? We're part of the match group. Part of the match yeah. group, okay. And Tinder debuted in 2012 and is now in every country in the world. Famously, it was piloted among the Alpha Sorority Sisters at USC, yep. right? Yep. Where, from you attended USC, but I recently got an honorary degree. Didn't graduate. What, what was the? Um, I I went to USC and took a leave of absence or dropped out, as they call it. That's um, the, that's <laughs> therefore, yeah. cementing your future yeah. as a startup CEO. Yeah, and then um, it was it was pretty awesome because they invited me to do the commencement speech mm -hmm. last year, and as part of it, I guess I got an honorary diploma, so which well is cool. <laughs> yeah. um, in New York City, among the the app's primary demographic, which is singles age 18 to 24. 60% of women and 80% of men have used Tinder, which is a pretty extraordinary statistic. I think yeah. I have some, see if I can work my magic here. So, awesome. there. Um, okay, so I'm not sure if people in this audience know how Tinder works. Um, you don't have to admit it if you do. I didn't, and I, I told Sean I had to put Tinder on my phone, I've been married for 10 years, and sort of say to my husband, just so you know, <laughs> this is on my phone for a reason. But I, um, <laughs> so it drew from my Facebook uh, when I set up my mm -hmm. profile. So that says that I'm a writer at The New Yorker. It is a picture of me seven months pregnant, so I'm not sure <laughs> anyone's going to be <laughs> swiping on me. Um, but uh, <laughs> I started to delve around and try to figure out how it works. And so what you do, you when, when you sign on, a, a picture comes up mm -hmm. of a candidate for you. Mm -hmm. um, so this, you know, I, I, I got a series of like, a guy with a monkey on his head. A lot <laughs> of, um, I don't know if I should take these things personally or not. There was sort of a debonair person exiting a private airplane. There were some <laughs> like dogs a lot and of sand and golf clubs, and yep. this was when um, I was doing this in California, where I live also. Yep. Um, but, so I kept, but I kept swiping left, which is what you do when you are rejecting these potential dates. Um, and then a big nope stamp appears, yep. but I was too chicken to swipe right, so <laughs> I don't really know what would have happened. Can you take us through it yeah. <laughs> a little bit? So um, we, we, you know, we have tens of millions of users all over the world. Mm -hmm. And we will show you people that we think um, you would have a successful conversation, relationship with. And if you don't like them, you swipe left. Um, and if you like them, you swipe right. Are they seeing my picture while I'm seeing their picture? Um, it, it, maybe. A little bit staggered? Maybe, yeah. maybe. Because it, it depends on a lot of things and um, you know, what their preferences are and whatnot. Um, pregnant, but if pregnant ladies. Oh my God. <laughs> uh, so if you if you if you swipe right and someone swipes right back, only then will we let you both know that you like each other. So it's kind of like okay. being in a room, looking at someone across the room, Got which it. is a light signal of interest. And if they look at you back, then you know there's there's a mutual interest in each other. So the and other thing that I noticed is that it offered to the the app offered me the chance to put an anthem, like yes. my personal song, yeah. right? Yeah. So that's a new feature that you yep. can, it's sort of supposed to give another layer of compatibility. Like yep. If I really like the Eagles and they really like the Eagles. Yeah. Then well, I think, it, so music is sort of embedded in the way we meet. If you think about it, like a lot of the times when you meet someone, there's background music. You go to the bars, the restaurants, the places that match your style of music and your taste of music. So we've known this for a long time and music was um, something we wanted to incorporate in an impactful way. So you can set the one song that best represents who you are mm -hmm. and you can also connect your Spotify account and, um, and we'll display the top artists you listen to, and then we'll use that information to give you better recommendations. So we'll help match you with similar uh, people who have similar interests in music. 
And what's your anthem? My anthem, I just changed it. Um, what did I, I, I put uh, um, These Are the Days by Van Morrison. Cool. So. So. Left. I'm actually no, seeing him in concert. Um. <laughs> yeah, left. <laughs> uh, so you grew up in Bel Air in a tight knit Persian community. I read yeah. somewhere that you have 43 first cousins. Yeah, I think it's 41. 41. Yeah. Okay. Um, and I'm assuming that in that community there may be traditional ways of meeting mates. Mm -hmm. And I'm wondering if you... You basically marry who your mom approves of. Okay, so this is, this <laughs> is exactly what I thought. So you probably designed this app in order to avoid your mother's choices <laughs> in mates. And to what extent did this does, does the design of the app reflect what you were personally trying to achieve or... I think I th it, it was a pain that I felt and that most people felt around me, um, not, not in the Persian Jewish community, but around me, period. Uh, and it wasn't, um, it, it wasn't the, the Jewish mom thing. It was uh, the fact that there were people that I want to meet but didn't have the courage or sort of was a little shy to walk over and say hello. After I would get an introduction, I was very open and I could build a connection, but it was that like kind of initial spark mm. that was the hardest. And, um, you know, I, I had friends who were like Casanova and they still had this problem and they still had this, um, this, this initial, um, there was always this initial problem of, get, of meeting someone or getting an introduction to someone you want to meet. And that's when we realized the hardest part is just knowing that they want to meet you. Because once you know that, it starts the conversation. It sort of takes away all the anxiety. Um, and that's what we tried to do at Tinder. Do you think that there is something generationally specific about that desire to remove all anxiety from life? I mean, in my experience, life is made of anxiety and it can be mm -hmm. generative and it can be what um, kind of sh shapes the course of yes. your choices. There's good anxiety and there's bad anxiety, I think. Um, I think we've, we've definitely created many relationships that would have no otherwise never have existed. We've created, I think, is there 10, oh, it's, yeah, 11 billion plus matches. Yeah, well and you know, that's friendships, marriages, relationships that would have never existed mm -hmm. before. Now, on one hand, you might be taking away anxiety that people face, and maybe you would argue that, that those are skills that that, you know, that individual probably uh, wouldn't develop as a result. But then on the other hand, you're making the world better by creating all these relationships that didn't exist. So I would say net net, you're doing a great thing for the world. But um, but there's still anxiety. <laughs> like, believe me, I face a lot of anxiety still. Um, what have you learned in the course of doing this about millennials attitudes towards intimacy, love, sex, marriage, mm -hmm. children, all of that? Um, great question. We, s we study this um, uh, at depth, um, given given what we're doing, I think there's no question Tinder has reimagined the way people meet. Um, but one thing that that I believe is that millennials, more than any generation before them, um, are more um, are, are are less likely to conform, and they embrace who they are and their unique self. And when you're looking for someone to a relationship, you're looking for someone who can embrace who you are. And because people are so much more individualistic, it's harder to find uh, a match or someone that sort of mm -hmm. connects with you. And instead of being restricted or limited to traditionally the people who go to the same school as you or the people around you, Tinder like opens up this world that you didn't have before. Uh, so I think it allows you to really find the person you're looking for. Mm -hmm. And millennials need that. I mean, there's... There's, I truly believe without apps like Tinder, not just Tinder, there's many great apps out there. Without apps like Tinder, um, I think you know, we would sort of be, uh, th the number of relationships I think would decrease um, versus now there historically, I think more people are in a relationship than ever before. People would imagine it's, it's the opposite, but I think you know, as a result of all these technology and everything we have, people are more connected than they've ever been before. And so what are people typically looking for on Tinder? Yeah, um, so uh, I think, look, if you ask our users, and we've done tons of surveys, over 80% would say they want a long-term meaningful relationship. 
Um, but what's cool about Tinder is it doesn't matter what you're looking for along the spectrum. You might be looking for a hookup um, or something short term. You might be young and not really in a mindset to have a serious relationship, or you might be looking for a marriage or something or something in between, or you don't even know. Um, whatever it is, Tinder's great because it just introduces you to someone and you can figure out with that person what is the purpose of this connection. Um, and as a result of, I would say, the, the openness of all the multi, the, as a result of sort of not telling our users what they're there for and letting them figure it out, you have um, everything from short-term to long-term relationships happening to friendships. I mean, you'll see over 15% of our users will write in their bio that they are there for a reason other than dating. Um, so that they're there to, they've just moved to a city and they want to make friends or they're traveling and they want to get recommendations from people on where to go and what to do. Bottom line is Tinder is probably history's most efficient platform at connecting people and creating new connections. And that, that can be leveraged in a variety of ways. You know, we call it hacking Tinder. Mm -hmm. We say our users hack Tinder all the time um, in that they, they use it in ways that we never imagined. Um, I hear stories all the time from people getting jobs to um, best friends to marriages to relationships to long lost loves. I mean, you hear all these stories all the time. Can you give me the feminist critique of Tinder? Mm -hmm. Well, I'll give, you, I'll give you what I think are uh, the, the, f the female users on the platform that we talk to say. Mm -hmm. um, I think in, in the real world, there are bad actors, and those bad actors can approach you, they can talk to you, and you have limited level of control. On Tinder, you control who gets to communicate with you. So um, that was our sort of founding principle, is that this idea that without having to reject someone, um, which is uncomfortable, or being rejected, which is also uncomfortable, you control who gets to speak to you because you can very lightheartedly let put some signal out there that you want to meet someone, mm -hmm. and if they want to meet you back, it's a match. And I think that's empowering to both men and women. Um, and then, um, you know, I think Tinder as an ecosystem is so vast that we have to do a better job for all of our users to sort of meet their individual needs. And, um, and we're doing that. I mean, there's, there's awesome features that we're launching like Spotify that really stems out of what our users are saying and asking us to do. Um, so, you know, our, I, I look at our job, the team's job is to, at this point, m the majority of our job is to understand what our users want to do mm -hmm. um, and understand our vision for the platform and where that intersects. Um, and, and user feedback is important in that. But by critique, I meant what do people, what are people concerned about a kind of power differential that could get built into a lot of, a lot of these interactions or that men and women may say they're seeking the same thing, but that often they're actually seeking something different. I mean, there has been quite a bit written about the kind of um, the ways in which Tinder insights like it promote a kind of casual hookup culture that doesn't necessarily, that sort of is more slanted yeah. toward what the typical young man would want than what the typical young woman would well, want. I mean, look, I've heard, I've heard both critiques. I've heard the, um, I would say the easier thing to critique, which is that uh, there's this, that Tinder is um, promoting uh, lighter relationships. It's actually statistically not true. Um, mm -hmm. In fact, uh, a really a really big study came out the other day that says millennials are having less sex than any generation before it, right? Even with the advent of Tinder, which you said 80% of Maybe they're too the busy men. Looking at their screens. Well, yeah. And, and, well, I think I think it's it's actually it, you know it's actually that they're they're less willing to settle and they're looking for meaning in relationships. And Tinder allows you to find someone. Um, and experience more people, build more empathy, get a better understanding of who you are, and, b and build these relationships. And, you know, we don't judge our users, whatever they want, whether it's a hookup or a marriage, or maybe they don't know, like, they have that right. I think th that's actually being, uh, I, I would say, if I was to say one thing about what it means to be a millennial, it's that you get to be who you are, where you are. And it's like, why judge? There's so much judgment, um, I think I hear, uh, out there about um, not just Tinder users, but users of any platform. And I think, um, I think you know, we're there to empower users to be who they want to be and find what they want.
So what do you, uh, let me see what this next slide is here. Okay, this is about marriages. Um, what do you think is essential to an effective Tinder profile? Ah, uh, great question. Um, if you, so we have sociologists um, on staff um, who, who study this all day long. Uh, they'll look at sort of statistically on Tinder, uh, what gets you the most swipes, but also they'll look at from a sociological standpoint what people are looking for. Um, and our sociologists and data analysts would say, uh, if you are smiling in a photo, it's better. If you uh, wear, wear bright colors, it helps you stand out. If you write something in your bio or um, it'll stand out. If you showcase something your interest, like one of your interests and whatnot, mm -hmm. you'll stand out. If you ask me, I think it's just being yourself. Um, it goes back to this principle that, that I was talking about earlier. I think we're really good at looking at photos, um, even before you get to the bio, and figuring out, finding the meaning in it, because we're inundated with photos now. I mean, mm -hmm. Instagram, Facebook, Snapchat, um, and we're better than ever before at interpreting what someone's trying to tell us. And if you're not really being genuine, we can smell it, we can see it, we'll know it in a second. So like model photos don't work on Tinder. Statistically, mm. they just don't work. Um, but photos where you really are yourself expressing an interest, whether it's a monkey on your head, um, or I don't, I don't know, whatever your, whatever, whatever your passions are, um, that gets the, the best response. Do, uh, something I noticed in the, in the ones I was flipping through was there were often pictures that had two or more people in them. I'm like, which one? Is, yeah. So is there a kind of a, uh, like, I'm a fun person, I hang out with other people. Yeah. So that's um, I think it's, so, so where that started was because we connect your Facebook, a lot of people's Facebook photos oh, are with it. their friends. Um, but I think actually um, that, just like kind of the selfie was, a beha was like an accident that then mm -hmm. took, became a meme. I think within Tinder, having a photo with you and a friend um, is sort of like a thing of safety. Um, it's sort of showcasing more of who you are. It's actually one of the reasons we created Tinder Social. Um, because what we, what we realized is people were trying to use Tinder with their friends, whether it was um, putting friends in their profile photos. Mm -hmm. There's even a case where uh, someone I know was swiping for to, to set up a friend, so like on behalf of a friend, because hmm. they felt that they would be a better representative of the person. Um, <laughs> and like Cyrano de Bergerac. Yeah, and then, and then what people do probably every single night, um, pre tender social, is they would message their matches and say, what are you doing tonight? Come out with me and my friends, bring your friend, and try to set out these group outings. Um, but it was just inefficient, so we figured, hey, why not help that happen on the platform? And mm -hmm. that's where Tinder Social came out, which allows you to like group with one, uh, uh, up to three friends, mm -hmm. and swipe and match with other friends, and then you guys are in a group chat and can figure out what you're doing tonight and sort of broadcast what you're up to. <clears throat> you have the, we have this other slide that your team provided about the most swipe, right swiped jobs, and yeah. it's pretty fascinating. I mean, I, I kept wanting to go at it and say, oh, all the men's jobs are active and all the women's jobs are passive, or you know, I wanted to figure yeah. out something like that. But in fact, the, the, the men, Doctor like model from. is number 10 for a female yeah. job, where it's number eight for a male job. I thought that was kind of interesting. Yep. Um, well, it goes to what I said, model photos don't work on Tinder. Right. And then- Ironically, I think if you're a model, you're at a disadvantage. Yeah. Because I, I don't think people, I, I, think, I think it's, um, it's good for us normal looking people. So <laughs> the only one that sort of sticks out to me here really is that college student is a job for women that's popular. <laughs> um, yeah, <laughs> but, but not for um, me. And how many guys out there well, are pretending that they're pilots? I don't know. Um, uh, yeah, <laughs> it's, it's definitely interesting. Dental hygienist. This is a big one. Yeah, there's a lot of nurturing on the female side and yeah. a lot of like rescuing on the male side. But well, I think that's probably a sociological thing. I, yeah. I think so much of what we're looking for is sort of um, nurture or nature. Or, um, but yeah, you, I, I think probably if you were to probably make generalizations, some of this is, 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 is accurate. 
So there's another, um, we, we couldn't uh, get the list of the colleges, but you can just see roughly, these are, so these are universities, right? The yep. top 10 most right swiped schools. Yep. So again, just completely, you know, reading it sort of superficially, you've got the, the burly guys in the Northeast and their flannels, I'm thinking with their <laughs> beards, and then you've got like the girls in the warm states down there, and, you know, there's sort of, but California was notably like a loser on both sides, which I thought was interesting. Um, <laughs> but yeah, you're obviously gathering a lot of really interesting sociological yes. information. Yeah. Um, I mean, there's, there's uh, you know, we have a very large team that looks at this data both from a, um, from a, a programmatic standpoint in the sense that we want to build better products, um, but also from a sociological standpoint. I mean, we invested very early um, I think it's unconventional for a tech company to invest in um, uh, a staff of sociologists like we have, you know, Dr. Jess Carbino, she runs uh, all of our sociological studies. She has a PhD in, in um, sociology and we kind of, it was almost by accident because we matched on Tinder. Uh, three years yeah, ago, I think now, or like four years the, ago. That's the most me cute story of all time. Yeah. <laughs> I've, I've seen that written about, um, yeah. yeah. Um, so you guys hacked Tinder. Yes. Um, yes. So can you talk to me a little bit more about the company culture? You have had a really interesting journey as very young CEO, very young ex-CEO, yeah. and, and now reinstated yeah. CEO. And I imagine that you have learned a lot along the way. Oh, yeah. Um, but what did you need to change within your company to make sure that um, you were on a better course from the one that led to you being uh, removed as CEO in the first place? Yeah, I think so. The, 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 it, gets, it gets sometimes um, public, like it's a little misunderstood the reason I was removed. So Tinder's growing, or still is, but especially in the beginning, we were growing at an insane rate. Um, and the board... I think was very fearful that as as at the age that I was around 27, 28 when I when I got fired or demoted, um, that I didn't have the work experience or to to be able to sustain and kind of grow this team. And to be honest, like I didn't even know if I had it. I mean, it was my um, first big job, and I was and, and I was learning on the job. And I think, ironically, being uh, I wasn't really fired, but being asked, I was, I was president and we brought in someone with a little more experience to help me. Um, ironically, that was the best experience. And I learned more through that process of how to be a CEO and how to be a leader. Um, because it's like, it's so stressful when everyone's looking to you for the answers mm -hmm. and you feel like you have to be perfect. And I'm not perfect. No one is. Um, and it, 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 would, it would, by not being the person who had to give the answers, and people would, st they would still come to me for the, w with mm -hmm. asking the questions, but I didn't feel the pressure to answer. I felt sort of like I could be their partner and like I, I was able to say, I don't know, let's go figure this out together. Mm -hmm. And um, ironically, I learned that that's actually what it means to be a leader, not someone who has the answers, but um, a good quarterback, someone who can sort of identify where we should go, but really lean on a team of, of a diverse team, each one who's good and bad at different things, but mm -hmm. together they sort of complete each other and um, allow us to get to where we need to go. And, you know, one of the thing, one of the two things people might know about Tinder, they know, you know, it's a photo-based, location-based dating site, mm -hmm. and they know there was a big lawsuit at Tinder. Mm -hmm. So can you talk a little bit about how the company has changed since the days, you know, if people don't know, in the early days, there was a, a small team of co-founders yep. and then a larger group that were sort of called co-founders and there was a, a romantic relationship between two co-founders, not you. And it went really far Spiraled south. And, out of and, and there were a lot of texts exchanged within the workplace that became really controversial yeah. in the core of this lawsuit. Yeah, I think, I think um, you know, to be honest, the changes we've made... Um, weren't really, had nothing to do with that. Um, I think Tinder, I've been proud of Tinder's culture day one. Unfortunately, there was a relationship between two people that got out of hand. And I think some, some things that were exaggerated drastically in the press, but the reality is a lot more boring. 
Um, you know, we, we, the texts uh, weren't that boring though. Well, the texts were horrible. <laughs> I, I agree. I agree. Um, but, but we've learned, look, we've learned, we've learned so much, not just from that experience, but from everything we've been through. I mean, we've, we've, um, we're still going through so much. And I think what's great about any corporate culture, um, you sort of look at the, the giants and you forget that once upon a time they were a small startup. They all had their dramas and issues and, mm -hmm. you know, Tinder is no stranger to drama, but neither is Facebook, neither is Snapchat. They all have that awkward, bad founding story or wrinkle, um, but it makes them who they are because they learn from that and they grow from that. We go through tough shit in life and we learn from that. And if mm -hmm. we, the ones that don't learn are the ones who don't survive. You gotta make an app that uh, makes it so you don't have to go through tough shit. Well, I, I mean, <laughs> but then you would never grow and you never learn. It, it's sort of what you were saying about the anxiety. I think, I think we learn from the anxieties we face and we also learn from the hard times. And mm -hmm. um, I think what's amazing about, um, about Tinder today is, um, you know, we've, we've been able to learn from those hard moments and apply them to be better. Um, but, you know, I don't want to comment on that one um, incident because I'm sure there's obviously a lot of changes and learnings that we made from it. So you said that there's a, you've learned a lot from the different ways that users put this, put the app to mm -hmm. work basically and that are not dating related. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it strikes me that since Tinder is in 196 countries, there are, I mean, like what is going on in Myanmar on Tinder? I'm just so curious to know, but it's you don't have to answer that specific one unless you know an interesting thing that the way people are using it there, but, um, or in any of these, you know, know. any countries the, the that are culturally uh, so different from ours where, you know, there may be real social or even yes. legal restrictions to the way young people interact. Yeah. I'll tell you, I'll, t um, I'll give you three fascinating stories on a broad spectrum. Excellent. One um, minute piece. I'll, give, I'll, I'll, go, I'll go quick. First one is there's like three people, like 30 people who live in Antarctica. Mm -hmm. um, two of them <laughs> matched on Tinder and I think are married now. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, the, so that's like small sort of uh, uh, smaller part of the world um, uh, or, or population size. And um, I remember in the early days, uh, there were uh, stories in the Middle East of, of uh, Jews in Israel matching, unknowingly matching with Palestinians sort of across the border because Tinder draws a radius and it mm -hmm. doesn't sort of know where you are, it just draws a mm -hmm. radius. Um, and there would be a guy and a girl sort of this like love story forming and they, they're like, okay, let's meet. And then they realized that wait, they actually don't live in the same country and they're from, you know, opposition sides. And it was kind of like a Romeo and Juliet story. And it kept happening and it happened so much that the mm -hmm. Israeli and Palestinian press kept covering this. And I thought that that was interesting that love is blind, as they say. Um, and the, the, the third story is one that we're going through now, which is in India. Um, so Tinder sort of taking India by storm because um, it's a market we're focusing on. And there you have like a lot of traditions around how you meet um, uh, that, that sort of haven't dissipated, that are mm -hmm. still there. And, you know, I think 85% of marriages happen through introductions that parents make. So your parents really do pick who you marry. Um, and Tinder sort of the, the, the antithesis of that. And it's this millennial audience taking control of how they meet. Um, and it's, I think, creating a lot of positive change, but also it's, um, it's, really it's scary, it's destabilizing. Yeah. Um, and, you know, it's, it's, it's amazing. I mean, I'm, I'm still learning, you know, what the impact Tinder has there, but you'll, you'll hear stories and read articles that sort of break it down, and I think it's creating a fascinating change in, in India. Interesting. I just wanted to end on... Um, the topic of the upcoming presidential election because yeah. I know that you have done some polling on Tinder, which I think is a really interesting use of the site where I think during the primaries, you saw who on Tinder matched with which of the, I think at that point it was Clinton, Sanders, yeah. Cruz, and Trump. Yeah. And those were the days, right? And yeah. the, and 
Um, it was, I'm sorry I don't have the slide. It, yeah. it, didn't, it, it didn't look quite good enough, so we didn't put it up. But, but I think that it was something like 80% of Tinder users matched with Clinton. It was something very... Yeah, it was, no, no, it no, was uh, the no, vast that's, majority. That's today's poll. It was, it was uh, with the, Bernie. The, it, was, it, was, it was Bernie, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Uh, the, I, th I think, and then, and then the second most popular candidate was, so for those of you who don't know, um, we did something called Swipe the Vote, which is we, we, we noticed, again, most of what we do stems from our users. Um, we noticed that there was a lot of sort of political conversation, but also political um, activism happening on Tinder, and that uh, people were campaigning, using Tinder to campaign for uh, various constituents. And, um, but, but also, you know, just looking at our employees, who are a lot of them are millennials, we noticed there's, there's sort of this confusion as to like who they best, best connect with. Mm -hmm. So we're like, well, we can solve that by helping, you, by helping you match with the candidate that best represents your views. So we created this algorithm where you answer a bunch of questions and we tell you, or you swipe and we tell you who you match with. Um, most of our users, and this was hugely popular, most of our users participated in this. Most of them matched with Bernie, who was the most popular candidate. Then it was um, Hillary Clinton, and then um, I actually don't think Donald Trump came next. I forget who came I next. I think it was Cruz. It was oh, Cruz. Yeah. yeah, Ted Cruz. And, and, and I think Donald Trump was actually like last, um, which I don't know if that's indicative of our audience yeah. or indicative of something else. And you're about to do, you'll do another one soon, I think I heard from your office yes. that you're going to do yes. another swipe the vote. So yes. um, check that out on yeah. Tinder. You can tell the significant others in your lives that that is why you're going to Tinder. <laughs> and thank you so much, Sean Rad. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.